In this episode, we look at prototypes, weathering a door, the beeve. Boy, at least I got something to look forward to. Rail fanon with Rivard. I got it. Going out to Bob's Railroad and checking out what he's up to. And also check out what the curmudgeon's gripe of the week is this week. Only in this episode of Sue the Milwaukee Road. All right, so we've got a uh, 85-foot or 86-foot uh, box car here. This is a Walther's car. Uh, it was lightly weathered already. This is previously weathered by somebody else, um, and even clear-coated or just a flat finish. Um, but I'm, what I'm going to do is try to knock down the silver door. I looked up the prototype on this. Prototype shows a pretty clean-looking car, uh, but fairly dirty doors. And not excessively dirty, but actually just the piping on the doors themselves are kind of dirty. So what I'm going to do is show you kind of the technique that I'd use be able to kind of bring myself to uh, a more prototypical looking door or at least kind of represent this car so what we've got here is just a little bit of mineral spirits that i just set in the cap here so we know that's what we're dipping into and then obviously uh, we're just going to use the black uh, panel line wash taco sauce i know we use it all the time um, but i find it to be a very versatile product and uh, since it's so versatile i'm going to show you what we can do with this to be able to get this silver door um, looking a little bit more like a prototype for years, Railroad were purchasing auto boxes to be able to haul auto parts, but then they got relegated to less strenuous service like hauling toilet paper. Which Railroad previously owned this BN car? Was it A, ATSF, B, SLSF, C, CBNQ, or D, BNO? We'll find out later in this episode. Boy, Wally, I wonder what ever made me think I was too old to play with trains. I like your BN hopper, Bob. Oh, thank you. My goal is to ha be able to back something up, though. That's why it kills me when this happens. Boy, you're an artist, Bob. Yep, exactly, Bill. That's what I was thinking. Well, I don't know. I guess because everybody was always telling you at school and at home to grow up and act like a man. Pretty soon you forget how to act like a kid. <laughs> well, look at look at here. Check out this kid. It is Mr. Bob Rivard. He had us over to run some trains. Wouldn't it be neat if a guy could stay a kid all his life? Oh, Beave, it's possible. Bob's done it. Uh, you'd never get away with that. But you know, when you get real old, you have what they call a second childhood. No fooling? No fooling. That second childhood is called retirement. Congrats to Mr. Bob Rivard from retiring from Care 11. It has given him the opportunity to do a lot more on his railroad, which we'll get to in a moment. And before we do, we'll take a look at number 2119, cutting off as it shoves up the hill here at Benjamin. Boy, at least I got something to look forward to. Real fanning with a bar to go. We're going to take a look at something that you don't normally see every day, and no, we're not talking about a crossing arm that'll eventually sag. We're talking about these couple of Larrys that go bolting across in front of the train. If they had any sense, they would have parked themselves next to Bob to watch this GP40. It's a Milwaukee Road, number 2046, as well as a Sioux Line GP38-2, number 4421. Both of these things are laboring to work their way up the hill. We had the opportunity, and thankfully, Bob recorded the crew conversation that takes place between this crew, the dispatcher, and another crew. Let's take a listen. Man, the caboose is just wiggling by the signal here at Central. We're aware, Tom? Just wiggling by the signal here at Central Avenue. I'll wiggle by so I can get the signal here. We got it. We'll catch back up with these guys in a bit. I want to take you on a brief little tour of the Twin Cities to give you an idea of some of the locations that Bob models, as well as the video that we're watching, the location of that. Uh, as far as the video is concerned, if you ever hear Humboldt mentioned, that's located right up here. Uh, Humboldt Yard is former Sioux Line, now CP. It used to come down, and then it would cut across the river here on the Camden Bridge, and then it would cut across Northtown. This is the BNSF Yard, former NP. If you ever see the Sioux Line Bridge with the Northtown shot, it's usually shot from St. Anthony here. Uh, but then we work our way down to uh, Shoreham. This is Shoreham, now the CP Container Yard. They work their way up through Columbia Golf Course, and then they work their way up through here. Now, Bob's footage is actually shot from Johnson Street. 
Uh, and then if you ever hear Central Avenue mentioned, that's located right here. Uh, but if we drop ourselves down to Street View just real quick, this gives you a look as to where Bob was standing. Uh, he was standing just a little bit east of this, but this train is working its way up towards New Brighton. So if we go up to New Brighton, New Brighton is one of the locations that Bob models, as well as Benjamin. Now, Benjamin is a street right here. It was a crossing uh, that's going to be mentioned a little bit later when we look at a little bit of footage of Bob's. But he works his way all the way up to this would be um, the pole yard. Now, the pole yard is former Sioux Line. Uh, they would interchange. Uh, the Minnesota commercial uh, nowadays, or the Minnesota transfer in Bob's day, would come into the pole yard, and they actually have the little depot located right here. This is New Brighton Depot, um, which is kind of a, an iconic little landmark. Went to Wisconsin Central, and then eventually became Canadian National. So to kind of bring you full circle, this is part of the areas that we're looking at uh, on Bob's Railroad, as well as the video. Instead of yammering on, let's cut back to and watch some of the railroad-related stuff. Isn't this railroad-related? <laughs> Now the first thing is, is I do use uh, one of these synthetic brushes, and this is just a synthetic brush that I use over and over uh, for the washes. It's wider and just a lot easier to apply. Uh, you can get them on Amazon, but I was thankful enough to have a fellow modeler, uh, Dan, that ended up providing me a set of these brushes, and boy, I use them a lot. Appreciate that, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go through and just wa wash down the entire door with the wash. Once I've applied the, the wash on here, I do come back in with the mineral spirits. What I'm gonna do is come in with cotton swab now. I'm just going over the high spots on the door. I'm doing with this is just actually picking up a lot of the excess uh, wash that was laid down. You put down a lot of liquid product. Manamana. 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 I'm tipping the car to let the mineral spirits run down. All the solution that runs down to the bottom, uh, I can just soak up with either a cotton swab or I'll use a paper towel. Okay, dabbing at it. First likes to dab at it. Brock Meyer, one of the few back to front wipers in the league. Very, very unconventional. Okay, now that I've knocked down the silver, it's not as intense, it's a lot lighter. I'm gonna come in uh, with the AK Interactive pencils. And this one here, I'm just going with the gunmetal graphite. Uh, and the reason why is because it's got a little bit of silver to it, and that little bit of silver that's in it um, helps match and work with the color uh, of the actual doors. So if these were, let's say, a yellow car, I might use a dark brown um, if I'm trying to emulate that these bars got kind of dirty. You may have noticed that I did dip this into the mineral spirits. And that's because I do want to be able to have more of a wet medium to be working with here. Now there's a line that went across there. I don't like that. I'll come in with a micro brush. Just erase that line. Just a little bit there. So we'll actually add a little bit back to the, the black. One thing about the mineral spirits is that you can just kind of keep going back and forth. You can go to the wash, to the spirits, to the wash, to the spirits, and get yourself kind of a balance in the way you like it to look. I'm pretty content with kind of that um, even overall silvered look. It's knocked it back just a little bit. Under the rails. This is just kind of an informal look of coming down into Bob's basement as we look at his railroad. Johnson Street with the bus right in front of us is where the footage that we were just recently watching. That's where that train would be crossing that road. But as you can see here, we got multiple levels 
His modeling is phenomenal. The time that you can spend looking through all the little details could be endless. So appreciate Bob letting us come in to be able to take a look at an overview of the railroad. Uh, the foreground here, that track that's working its way up is coming out of Shoreham. There is the depot, the New Brighton depots in the distance there. The <laughs> Gotta get the guy in there. Deli! The pole yard that we mentioned is right here in front of us that we're gonna duck under. One thing to note is that there was a wall that was torn out, actually a number of walls that were torn out. Bob actually put in a Y off in the distance there. Some of these views that you normally wouldn't have been able to see are now be able to be seen. So as we uh, pop into the helix here briefly, as you can see, this is the backside of one of the scenes. Oh yeah, thanks Captain Obvious. Uh, but there is scenic areas back here as well. And that's what's so cool. There's so many different little vignettes that you can be able to check out that normally you wouldn't see. There was a wall here that didn't allow you to even have this view. As we pop out of the helix, you can see there's still a lot of area to cover. We've got uh, Cardigan Junction here in the foreground. That's the depot on the right. We can kind of swing off to the left here and take a look. This is the pole yard that we mentioned in the video. There's that strange guy in the background. Hello. We do have uh, Benjamin Street on our right-hand side. He did cut the stairs back to give ourselves a little more room to kind of cut through here. And as you can see, there's so much railroad to cover in such little time for a segment like this. We really blasted through it, but Bob does a phenomenal job, and he invited us back to check it out again later. Real penny with the bar to go. Continue. Transfer one to the pusher. Pusher. How are you coming? Stop signal there at central. 2126 to the dispatcher. Two shorter CCC dispatcher, over. I have permission to go by the red signal here to get on the hind end of that train. Uh, engine 2126 at Central Avenue has permission to pass signal displaying stop indication. The block is occupied, over. Engine 2126 has permission to pass the signal displaying stop. The block is occupied. Roger. Thank you. Sharm, super truck to the CTC dispatcher, over. Two Sharm, CTC dispatcher. Yeah, you can put that number two main back in service. Roger, okay, uh, all the repairs are made on it. What was that? You said, are all the repairs made on it so it's back in service again? The number two main is back in service. Roger, CTC dispatcher out. Sharm, super truck out. And I'm going to go back and I'm actually going to look at um, the vertical posts. So these vertical door posts, I'm just going to go in and just put just the wash on just the post. One thing to keep in mind when working in a process like this is a lot of back and forth. Here I'm going to darken these panels again a little bit more because I think they look darker in the prototype. All right, now I move on to the Doc O'Brien's weathering chalks. I've got uh, grimy black and grungy gray. The grungy gray, as you can see, is more kind of a brown, and then black is obviously black. Uh, the brush I'm using is just kind of this nubby little brush, and I end up just taking a regular brush. I end up cutting off the brush and just having just this little nubby brush to be able to apply um, more controlled application is where I'm um, putting the chalks. <laughs> Once we've chalked everything, um, I'll go over and just lightly hit a few more areas that I wanted to do. I end up taking a wide brush. This one here is just a pretty wide, flat bristled brush. I'm going to just bring it down the whole entire door with all the chalk that has already currently been laying there, just to give it again a little bit more natural weathering. And even once this has a little bit of chalk on it, come back out to the outside of the car. 
I'm cleaning up just a little bit of chalk that I had in the lid. So now I've loaded the brush and then I'm just going to hit the top panel uh, up in the large area here and just going straight down. What this is doing is actually highlighting all the rivets and you're trying to hit just the top edges of all of the door panels. I'm bringing the mineral spirits back in one more time uh, with a micro brush and all I'm going to do here is go along and just lightly hit these faces of the panels. So I've dipped it in mineral spirits, I've wiped it off just on the side, just use a rag like this here. I'll dip it in and then just dab it just so it's just wet but not soaking. When doing this, I generally work towards um, a joint. I don't usually work to the middle, just as an example, if you go like this. Wherever you lift your brush, you'll leave a little dark spot, so I just go all the way to the joint. This is just a little micro brush, again, with a little bit of chalk. I'm just touching up the edges of some of these things, so I want to see the chalk out to the very edge. All right, if you're paying attention close enough, you'll have seen that the little piece uh, was knocked off on the edge here. I end up using this extra thin quick setting cement. So there we have it, a fairly straightforward process in being able to uh, set up the silver door to have a little bit more of a muted look. As I said before, this car is actually set 1985-86. Um, the photo I worked off of was from 82. I kind of reference some photos from around the area to kind of get myself close, but at the end of the day, fairly content with the end results. Did you guess Pullman Standard built these cars in 1967 or 1968 for B, SLSF, or the Frisco? The St. Louis and San Francisco Railway reporting marks were SLSF, commonly known as the Frisco. Hey, you get on there. Let me know when you get on, man. I'll have to release the air. Here, I'm shoving the slack in. Okay, we'll pull on him again. To Humboldt Yard, to Humboldt 1. 8 o'clock Humboldt. Van, uh, would you tell him to put that caboose on the south runaround instead of uh, car shop 2? South runaround instead of car shop 1. Okay. I thought I'm going, Rehabs, uh, Gabby. You may want to re-watch this for the father-son combo that's involved here. Tom Van Gilder is in the caboose. His dad, Leroy Van Gilder, is in the pusher. It's kind of a fun little fact. Alright, 10-4. I got some things that will be a little different than that. Some of it was duplicate, but some of it's a little different. I'm an agent. 21-26 to the CTC dispatcher. Too short of CTC dispatcher, over. While we're cut off, we'd like to come down number one main and back down and get those caboses. Okay, uh, you can come west on uh, number one main, over. Okay, to come west on number one main. All right, thank you. One of the biggest influences I've had from Bob Rivard is modeling the stuff that you see. This is my era. Clearly that boxcar is one that we're kind of working on. And on Bob's railroad, it's definitely neat to recreate a lot of the scenes that he saw back in the day. I'm a firm believer in modelers influencing modelers. Here we've got a Mike Buddy van, clearly in the footage that Bob took. How cool is that? Keep up the great work, Bob, and thanks for the footage. Here's a curmudgeon coming at you for the grab of the week. The grab of the week this week is about those sneaky purchases. I'm telling you right now, you know what I'm talking about. When you're at a show and you're walking along and you're like, hey, would you look at that price? It looks pretty dang good. Five dollars for one of those. <laughs> I think I'll have four. So you end up spending 20 bucks, and you're sitting there saying, I didn't need to spend $20, but I might as well go back and get a couple more. I mean, I don't need them, but I might as well, just in case. Sneaky purchases, catching the curmudgeon. And that's the curmudgeon's grab of the week. And I didn't need to spend $20, but I might as well go back and get a couple more. <laughs> Hey 
A big thanks to everybody that watches to the end that has hit like, hit subscribe, as well as made comments in the past. It's those actions that help share this content, so if you haven't checked out other episodes, feel free to do so. You can also check out the tour of the GN in 1970, as well as the past episodes of the GN in 1970. 70s. I didn't need to spend $20, but I might as well go back and get a couple more.